Hello and welcome to the fourth and final webinar of our Upgrade Your Peptide Maps webinar series. My name is Simon Cubbon and I will be your moderator for today's session. Today's session is entitled Easily Navigate All Biotherapeutic Modifications How to Confidently Compare and Interpret Your Peptide Maps with Powerful Yet Intuitive Software. Before we begin, we want to cover just a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets that you can use. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. We will try to answer these during the webcast, but if a full answer is needed or we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. We do capture all your questions. Additional materials are also available within the resource list widget that looks like a green folder at the bottom of your screen and you can expand your slide area by clicking on the Maximize icon in the top right hand of the slide area itself or by dragging the bottom right hand corner. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the Help widget. It has a question mark icon and will cover most of the common technical issues that you could encounter. And an on-demand version of this webcast will be available approximately one day after this webcast is finished and can be accessed using the same link that has driven you here. The session today will be presented by Shannon Williams and Dr. Martin Samanik. Shannon is a Senior Research Associate, associate with Coherence Biosciences and Martin is an Application Scientist within our Life Science Mass Spectrometry team at Thermo Fisher Scientific. During this interactive presentation, we also have Jennifer Sutton, the Biopharma Finders Product Manager here, to answer your technical questions in the chat box and at the Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Over the course of this series of four short webinars, you will have already learned about advances in the full peptide mapping workflow, covering increased protein digestion efficiency and reproducibility, how to separate the resulting peptides more reliably and with less variability, and how a new MS platform allows you to comprehensively map biologics. So our final episode in this series today focuses on how powerful yet intuitive software allows you to confidently compare and interpret your peptide maps, as well as intact data, so with that, I would like to welcome Shannon to begin her presentation. Thank you, Simon, and welcome, everyone. Uh, before I get into the software, let me briefly tell you about Coherus Biosciences. At Coherus, we make biosimilar therapeutics, which are biological products that are highly similar to an already FDA-approved product. And throughout the production process of our therapeutics, it's necessary for us to confirm through a long list of te analytical techniques that the product we're producing is similar to the originator to ensure the same level of safety and efficacy. So one technique we rely on is mass spectrometry, which can tell us a lot of information about our product. But today in this webinar, we're going to talk in my section about peptide mapping and how Biopharma Finder helps speed up the lengthy post-analysis bottleneck that is processing and data interpretation. And since we've implemented the software into our workflow, it's not only allowed us to meet tighter timelines, but also to provide information that before wasn't realistic to deliver due to time constraints and limitations in our previous software. So one main purpose of running a peptide map is to confirm the primary sequence of your protein. And in the lab, the protein of interest is enzymatically digested into peptides of an appropriate size that will achieve the MS2 coverage needed to confirm the amino acid sequence of each peptide. And the software's mapping interface, which I've shown here, makes it easy and quick to access, or sorry, to assess the sequence coverage. And it's displayed according to the parameters originally set in your method, but a few important parameters can be adjusted without requiring reprocessing, which are maximum peptide mass cutoff, minimum confidence, or minimum peak area. And in the color-coded heat map on the right, red in indicates high-intensity identifications, while blue indicates lowest intensity and retention times are also given for each peptide. And these windows, and any results windows for that matter in the software, 
can be repositioned according to how the user prefers to view the windows, which is a nice feature. So in this example I've shown here, the missing coverage at the right is clearly identifiable. So curious if I have at least MS coverage for this region, a search can be quickly done using the software's filter feature in the results table, which I'm showing in blue at the bottom. It's just a, a cutout, a zoom in of the results table. So there's up to 18 filter options for the columns in this table, and by, sec by selecting the contains filter in the peptide sequence column in the results table, which is circled in red here, and in putting the sequence of the peptide that's missing the MS2 coverage, which in this case is the TISC peptide, BioPharma Finder reduces the results table to include only identifications that contain that sequence. So to give you a screenshot of what that looks like here, I've customized the process and review window and placed the full scan spectra in the top pane. So I can quickly scroll through a list, the list here of potential MS identifications and see at each spectra at the top as I scroll down, along with other useful information in the table like delta PPM and retention time. And in this example, a, a list of MS identifications of TISC and associated miscleave peptides is shown. So quick assessment of the identifications questionable delta PPMs allowed us to dismiss these as false positives, which is an inevitable consequence of processing, and it varies based on your method parameters you set. One way to avoid a large occurrence of false positives is to adjust the noise level in the component detection page in the processing method, where alternatively to entering a value, there's an adjustable bar on the base peak chromatogram that gives you a more visual option to determine noise level. So for this example, I probably could have done a better job fine-tuning to get less of these false positives. And coming back to this example, we were able to quickly conclude after seeing just this one run that this small peptide probably eluded in the beginning of the run when the mass spec was still diverted to waste rather than the LC, and so that the LC method needed to be adjusted. So earlier I mentioned that the software has allowed us to report findings that previously weren't practical due to time. And in this example, BioPharma Finder makes it easy to calculate relative abundances of N or C terminal clipped peptides. And usually when I report these results, I also use the sequence coverage map to display the N or C terminal clipping. The heat map, which is on the right here, it's an especially useful tool when your audience doesn't have a mass spec background so they can visualize the results and make sense of, of what you're telling them. And also retention time labels, which are on each of these peptides, if you look at the middle of each, uh, they offer further information. And in this particular example, if you look, you can see the retention times, they're a bit small, but you can see that the smaller the peptide, the shorter the elution time, which makes sense. But with the exception of the glutamine at the end terminus, that, that peptide, the retention time is shifted to later. And when I look further into the database, because that was a flag for me when I first saw this, um, the identification there is within ammonia loss at glutamine, which is the reason for the retention time shift. So that's something that I probably wouldn't have noticed if it wasn't for this map. And it's helpful information for us. So by selecting the contains filter in the identification column of the results table, uh, similar to my previous example where I filtered that column for, or when I filtered the sequence column for TISC uh, sequence. In this case, if I input R19 into the identification column, since arginine at residue 19 is the C terminus of the peptides I'm choosing to compare, the results table is reduced to include only identifications made for these R19 peptides. And then this table was further filtered to include only identifications with competence scores above 80%, which reduced the time needed to manually inspect each identification. So 
any false hits that are found can be left unchecked when you're exporting your results to Excel. And in Excel, it's easy to create a template, which I've shown here on the right, that these results can be easily copied and pasted into for a quick calculation of relative percent abundances, which is something we, we didn't report before for this molecule, but are from, from here on out. Thanks for that so far, Shannon. So as part of the interactive nature of this webinar, our first poll question to the audience is, where is the bottleneck within your current data analysis? Does it lie within post-translational modification abundance determination? Is it with sequence variant analysis? Is it creating overlays of UV or base peak chromatogram traces? Or with confirming the sequence coverage? Or indeed, identifying unknown peaks within the chromatogram? Or some form of all of the above? So you can vote now by selecting any of the radio buttons and then submit. So I can see that uh, people are busy submitting their answers now. So I'll just give you another five or 10 seconds just to submit there. Some interesting results coming through. And I think that's most people now. So thank you for submitting those. So if we take a quick look at the results, um, in top first place um, are people who have issues with all of the above. And if we break it down into individual issues, then post translational modification abundance determination, um, quickly followed by sequence variant analysis, then identifying peaks within the chromatogram, and then confirming the sequence coverage seems to be the order in which uh, the bottlenecks lie within the labs. Is this something that you'd agree with, Shannon, and that you see? Yeah, actually, I did choose post-translational modification abundances. So yeah, it looks like we're in line with that, which I will talk about that further in my, <laughs> Excellent. In my slides. So that's great. OK. Great, thank you. All right, thanks, everyone. Um, Real quick, let me talk about sequence variant analysis, though, before we move on to, to PTMs. So what exactly is a sequence variant? Uh, as the name suggests, it's an unintentional amino acid substitution, omission, or insertion during protein biosynthesis, which results in a different sequence than what was intended. And these errors can occur in DNA replication, RNA transcription, mRNA maturation, or protein translation. And there have been reported cases of sequence variants causing adverse effects, effects such as aggregation, reduction in potency, reduced antigen binding affinity, and reduced thermostability, to name a few. So it's something worth keeping tabs on. Now, a single amino acid substitution constitutes usually less than 0.1% difference of a typical full-length MAB. So the task of detecting such a small change is a challenge, and that's why peptide mapping is the most common approach, where if a sequence variant does exist, the mass shift will be more apparent in these small peptides as opposed to analyzing the full protein. So performing a sequence variant search in Biopharma Finder just requires you to choose, which I have zoomed in here on, which search you prefer in the search for amino acid substitutions field, which you can find in your processing method. And the, search, the software cannot, can search not only for single base substitutions, but all possible amino acid substitutions, which I know not all softwares can do. And it can be useful since some translational substitutions may be the result of mischarging or misreading at the translation step, and that challenges the single base change assumption. Uh, as a customary practice in our group, we include the single base change in all processing runs since uh, it's the most likely to occur in our samples, and it takes less processing time than the all substitutions option. So even if sequence variants aren't of concern initially when we do our analysis, if future concerns do arise, the data is there to interpret immediately and requires no reprocessing. And then after processing, the results table can be filtered to include only sequence variant identifications just by selecting, which I've shown in the bottom right, 
non-blanks in the sequence variant column. And expanding on that, after filtering the results table at the bottom for those sequence variants in that manner, I also filtered the table to include only MS2 hits, which I did a few columns over to the right where the header says ID type. And then I can scroll through the MS2 spectra to manually confirm the identifications while at the same time using the, fact, the fragment coverage map at the top right to assess coverage of the sequence variant location. And in this example, the serine to asparagine variant at position 435 is selected, which is the top line on the results table, if you can see it highlighted. And the MS2 coverage supports this identification in addition to the historical data we have confirming that variant. Scrolling down to the next variant identified in the table, though, which is glutamine to lysine at residue 438, the MS2 spectra is quite noisy, as you can see. The remaining MS2 identifications for this variant are also questionable. So this variant was flagged as a probable false hit. With this customized layout, I can quickly sift through the sequence variant identifications and then export the results list according to what I've left checked on the column on the left, and then share it as an Excel file. So getting on to post-translational modifications, uh, that's another good reason to run a peptide map is to assess modification abundances. And in Biopharma Finder's modification summary window, thresholds for the percent abundance calculation can be adjusted at the top. And the modification results table can then be filtered to target your modification of interest. And these values can be exported to Excel if, if you need for further data compilation. And generally, our timelines are very short, so we usually process and interpret results on the fly as they come off the mass spec, adding our PTM outputs to a comprehensive table we have in Excel. But if your timeline allows it, you could always take advantage of batch processing, and that would require less manipulation in Excel afterwards. In this example I've shown, we were interested in deamidation levels of our protein circled in red, which is the filter we used. And here, asparagine at residue 404 is selected to get information on what peptides were identified at this location, which is down below that table in the components window at the bottom of the screen. The components contributing to the percent abundance calculation for that modification are highlighted in blue, and these components can be selected to show the corresponding MS2 spectra and fragment coverage map simultaneously on the right in the layout that I've selected for my workflow. In the new 2.0 version of the software, which isn't shown here, this component table can be edited, so it lets you include or reject specific components in the, to, to be included in the percent abundance calculation, which is very nice. Uh, another feature that makes this software very helpful to me is the labeled chromatogram. And by default, this chromatogram is labeled with retention time, but also has the capacity to label the peptides that have been identified for each peak. So you just right-click anywhere in the field and select peptide under the label field. And the chromatogram is also color-coded, as you can see. The pink shading represents identifications of my protein in this instance, and the green shading shows what peaks contain masses that haven't been identified. So zooming in, you can see that the shading is blocked, and the height of each block indicates the peak height of the component. And as you zoom in on peaks additionally, the lower intensity peptide identifications can also be seen. So there is more information hidden there if you, if you look further. And when an unidentified peak does exist, if it's a particular peak that's of interest, the retention time can be used to filter the results table to pinpoint the masses 
that are detected at that peak, it's very quick to do. Uh, if a more general assessment of the unidentified masses is needed, the results table can be filtered and sorted, as I've shown here, to quickly focus on those with the highest abundance. So here, I pull up only unidentified masses by first selecting blanks in the identification column, and then further filter that list by including only the top 1% in the MS area column. And if a possible peptide candidate does exist for any of the unknown masses we get, the de novo search feature can be used to determine a correlation between the MS2 spectra of the unknown peptide and that predicted from the sequence input by the user, and that's shown at the bottom, the field where you enter that information in. So in summary, Biopharma Finder has greatly reduced our time required to deliver the abundance of information generated by peptide mapping. The software is straightforward. It's been simple to teach to my other colleagues and simple to pick up. The graphic displays for sequence coverage are easy for any audience to interpret, and the color-coded heat map adds an additional layer of useful information. And the filtering and sorting functions make data mining fast with the ability to target values with any of the outputs, within any of the outputs listed here. Um, sequence variant analysis is simple to set up and increasingly important to regulators. Post-translational modification abundances are made transparent with the ability to know and now even manipulate what components are used in the calculation. And finally, the peptide label chromatogram, which previously required a large chunk of post-processing time to create, now is done for me. So with all of that, it's a very, very useful software to us and has been a pleasure to implement into our lab. So thank you for giving me your attention today. And that concludes my talk. Thank you, Shannon. That's a great insight into the use of Biopharma Finder for peptide mapping within Coherus. So before we pass to Martin for the final section of the webcast, we just have another poll question. So which software platform are you currently using? So from the list, we have Thermo Scientific's Biopharma Finder, we have Waters Unify, we have Protein Metrics Bionic, there's Agilent's Mass Hunter, Bruker's Compass, Cyex's Biopharma View, or uh, other software that you can use for peptide mapping. So I'll just give you uh, another five seconds or so just to submit your answers as to the software platform that you're currently utilizing within your laboratories, and then we'll just take a quick look. Excellent, okay. So we'll just take a look at those results now. Thank you very much for providing your answers. So we can see that 50% of attendees are using uh, some other form of software, and um, we have a good use of Thermo's Biopharma Finder, and then there's also uh, good use of Waters Unify and Protein Metrics Bionic with uh, some Bricker and Cyx users here as well. So thank you for that information. So now I shall pass over to Martin Samenig for the final section of today's webinar. Thank you, Shannon, for the nice overview and your experiences with Biopharma Finder. Uh, in the next 15 minutes, I will give you an overview about the peptide mapping workflow within the software and also mention other nice implemented features. In Biopharma, uh, there are three major workflows to characterize biotherapeutics using LCMS methods. The intact analysis with limited sample prep and the LCMS analysis under native or denatured conditions. All Vanquish UHBOCs coupled to Orbitrap-based mass packs give high-quality protein spectra with a typical charged state distribution. Software is then needed to calculate the uncharged intact mass of the protein. 
Then the subunit analysis containing a, a, sum, a simple sample prep step, uh, for example, a reduction with DTT or TSEP to separate light and heavy chain or the cleavage of the heavy chain at the hinge region using the IDS enzyme. In this workflow, the deconvolution of isotopically resolved as well as isotopically unresolved protein spectra are required. Last but not least, the peptide mapping workflow, where an enzyme like trypsin is used to digest the protein, and after LCMS analysis, software is needed to identify the peptides as well as identify and relatively quantify the PTMs. For the deconvolution of isotopically resolved and unresolved spectra, we use protein deconvolution. And for peptide mapping uh, part, uh, the PEPFinder software. Now we have Biopharma Finder, which combines both workflows in one single software package. I separated uh, my talk in three sections, representing the three major parts of, of Biopharma Finder, the protein sequence manager, uh, peptide mapping, and in-text analysis. Starting point for both the peptide mapping part as well as the intact analysis part is the protein sequence manager. Here you can manage and store the protein sequences you, you need for your analysis. You can, you can save your proteins and organize them in different categories, giving you also the info about average and monoisotopic masses as well as number of chains, modifications, and number of amino acids. In the detailed view, uh, you can edit the protein sequence and the software gives you the calculated masses. With double-click on the particular amino acid, you can insert fixed modifications and define the disulfate bridges, if they are already known. On the right side, variable modifications of the N-terminus, the C-terminus, or a specific side chain can be defined. All this information is then saved and can be used with the peptide mapping or deconvolution algorithms. Now I will give you an overview about the peptide mapping part and how you can easily start an analysis. The embedded peptide mapping algor algorithm supports data of all orbit trap and ion trap based instruments, as well as all common fragmentation techniques. Glycoforms and modifications like, like oxidation and deamidation are often monitored with peptide mapping experiments and can be identified and relatively quantified with Biopharma Finder. You have also the possibility of an error-tolerant search to track unexpected modifications. The identification of sequence variants and the disulfate bridge assignment is also a very useful function in Biopharma Finder. The data processing in Biopharma Finder can be categorized in three major steps. Please the hold. The component detection, where the peak picking takes place, and the peak alignment between replicates and conditions. The peptide mapping identification on MS1 level via the match of the theoretical uh, and the measured peptide mass, as well as on MS2 level. Here, a predicted peptide fragment spectrum is compared to the measured one. This is a very powerful tool in Biopharma Finder because common algorithms are based on empiric models and just use the mass information without taking the fragment intensity into account. If you compare the predicted spectrum from Biopharma Finder on the right side and the observed spectrum, you can see that the algorithm is able to make a very good prediction of the masses as well as their intensities. The last part is the quantification, where the peak area for each isotope in a detected isotope cluster is used. How powerful the fragment spectrum prediction is, uh, is can be demonstrated with the following example. Here you can see the fragment spectrum of the glycosylated peptide of rituximab. Using collision-induced fragmentation for such peptides always gives you spectra with a lot of glycan fragments, but with more or less no fragments related to the decomposition of the peptide itself. For common algorithms, it is more or less impossible to identify such peptides, but Biopharma Finder can do that without issues. Starting a peptide mapping analysis is very easy. You have to define the experiment name and the, raw file, and the raw data files. If you have more raw files, you can define different conditions. 
Then you can select the protein sequence defined in the protein sequence manager before. Choosing a predefined method and the analysis is added to the job queue immediately or after the review of the method settings. I would recommend to always review the settings before starting the analysis because some parameters are critical and can unnecessarily extend the required analysis time. In the method editor, the component detection and uh, de identification settings can be defined. The absolute MS signal threshold is a critical parameter, and if this parameter is set too low, the data analysis will take quite long. I would recommend to set the value quite high for a quick check. If the coverage is not good enough, the level can be lowered. The maximum chromatographic peak width is also a critical parameter, especially for peptides which are eluding quite in quite broad peaks. With the settings of one minute, all peaks broader than one minute are excluded from the data analysis. Please increase the value to two or three minutes if needed. The time can be also restricted to exclude, for example, the wash and equilibration step of the gradient from the data analysis. This can help to speed up the calculations further. In the peptide identification panel, the mass accuracy can be defined and should be not higher than 5 ppm for orbital-based spectra. In the advanced search window, the range of unexpected modifications can be set. In this example, a mass shift of minus uh, 58 to plus 162 is considered in the analysis in addition to the defined variable modifications in the sequence manager. The glycans are also defined in the protein sequence manager. Here we search, for example, for CHO peptides, uh, uh, glycans. Human glycans can be also selected. Amino acid substitutions from single base exchange or search for all substitutions can be included here. For the following section allows the search for disulfide bridges where the raw file of the reduced run uh, can be defined. The last window allows the selection of the protease and definition of custom proteases. After the data analysis, the results can be reviewed in the Process and Review tab, showing the, showing the extracted ion chromatogram for a selected peptide and the localization in the base B chromatogram. Here, for example, disulfide linked peptide of the light chain is selected and, and also highlighted in the sequence window. Another view allows the comparison of the different conditions and the possibility to change parameters and reprocess immediately. On the right side, the acquired and the predicted fragment spectrum from the selected peptide is shown. The second, the, uh, one of the two reports from Biopharma Finder is the sequence coverage map. Here, the sequence coverage map is shown in, in the table and graphically in the sequence below. Shannon already demonstrated the advantages of, of this report in detail, so I will go ahead. The other report is the modification summary, uh, where all identified modifications on each amino acid are summarized. It is very easy to compare the results of the relative quantification for different conditions or replicates. In the lower panel, the identified components for the particular modifications are listed. For example, different charge states for one modified peptide. Shannon already mentioned that soon we will launch the next version of the Bi of Biopharma Finder, the Biopharma Finder 2.0. I want to give you a preview of new implemented features. For, for example, for peptide mapping experiments, it's now possible to select the peptides uh, and which should be used for the calculation and display of the sequence coverage. Also, the peptides and modifications used for the quantification and the modification summary can now be defined and changed. We integrated also features for HEX experiments, for example, the deuterium uptake plot shown on the right side. And for disulfide bond assignments, we have now integrated a column where the involved cysteines of the bonds are displayed. With the filtering function, it's very easy to display all identified disulfide bonds. With Biopharma Finder, you can also deconvolute pro protein spectra, and I also want to mention this very shortly. 
With the software, you have the possibility to deconvolute isotopically resolved spectra using the extract algorithm. This enables the calculation of the exact monoisotopic as well as the average mass of the protein. For isotopically unresolved spectra, the algorithm RESPECT can be used to determine the average mass, usually used for very big proteins. Also, for the intact part, we improved Biopharma Find and a new version. The complete intact workflow was redesigned, and this makes it now much more user friendly and automated. You have now the possibility to calculate uh, automatically the drug antibody ratio needed for ADC characterization, and the signals are automatically labeled with the identified glycan as well as the drug load. To compare different runs, you have now the possibility to make multi consensus plots and the reprocessing in real time is now also available in the intact analysis part of the software. To sum up this, the Biopharma Finder software combines peptide mapping analysis and intact analysis in one package and can be used for Orbitrap as well as IronTrap based instruments. Enables easy reporting with the sequence coverage map and the modification summary. The new version Biopharma 2.0 will be launched in the next couple of weeks, so stay tuned. Uh, we made several how-to videos for different functions in Biopharma Finder. You can find the links on planetorbitrap.com slash Biopharma Finder. I hope I was able to give you a short overview about the functions in Biopharma Finder. And if you have any additional questions, we will open the Q&A session directly after the last poll question. Thank you. Super. Thank you very much, Martin, for that overview of the additional functionality within Biopharma Finder, both version 1 and also what's coming within version 2 itself. So before we open up the Q&A session, there's one final poll question. So based upon what you've seen today, um, would you like us to improve peptide mapping, like us to improve intact analysis, or provide a simplified middle top-down workflow, or even include a HCP workflow? And finally, would you like a free trial version of Biopharma Finder, or is this not relevant to your needs at this current time? So I'll just let that... Um, uh, you just submit your votes now. So I'd like to say a, a huge thank you to both Martin and Shannon for a great webcast. I think there was loads and loads of really, really useful information there, and certainly a nice view of what's going to be coming for version 2.0. So I'd certainly like to thank you for your attention during the final of our four-part peptide mapping series. So if we just take a look at uh, those results now, I think pretty much everyone has uh, submitted. So. Uh, there's quite a few people who would like a free trial version of Biopharma Finder, and it seems as though, um, I guess if you take the average of all of that, you would like us to improve uh, most aspects of the software, which I guess isn't necessarily um, a surprise. So just before we move to the Q&A session, I'd just like to remind you that the complete series of all four webinars will be available on demand. And I'd now like to welcome Jennifer Sutton to the panel, and we would like to open the Q&A section of the webinar. Feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box. Additionally, we do value your feedback and would like to ensure that we are offering you relevant webcasts and information. So please help us to improve upon this by completing the short survey. So if we just take a look at some of the questions that we have here. Um, so the first question that I have is, do I need a reduced and non-reduced sample for disulfide mapping. So I don't know who would like to take this question. Yeah, I can take this one. So we really recommend to use a reduced as well as a non-reduced sample because then the confidence in the result is much higher. So just use both, uh, both files and you just specify in Biopharma Finder in the settings what is the reduced and what was the non-reduced sample and then you have much higher confidence in the results. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is, I often miss very small peptides uh, within my sequence coverage map. How can I identify them? Um, that, I guess, applies to mine since that actually happened in my slides. Um, one option <laughs> is they're coming off 
too early and you're not setting your parameters correct to, to get them. But another option is to look at the miscleaved peptides, if, if that's acceptable to you. That's how I usually get them. I don't know if, if Martin... Well, this is from Martin, but... Um, yeah, completely yeah. right. A, a critical parameter is also the mass range. So it's very critical yeah. to start acquiring at 200 M over set or something like that to be able to, to measure and also to select the, the small peptides as, as precursors. And also, for example, trap columns or, like you mentioned, diverter valves are not, not that, uh, that good. Super, thank you. Um, there's a good follow-up question to that as well, which um, is, what could the uh, unidentified peaks in the shaded chromatogram view of the peptide map be? Um, I would always guess from my enzyme. That's usually what they end up. We always run up an enzyme blank to confirm that, but usually that's what they're due to. Excellent. I have Great, thank one you. comment. Sorry, go on, Martin. Sorry. What you can do in biopharma finder, for example, you can just add the protease as a, as a second protein to your sequence, and then you can easily identify also peptides from the protease. Hmm. Great idea. That's a very, uh, very good idea, <laughs> Martin. Uh, thank you for sharing that one. Um, so I think we've got time for one more question, and that question will be, what are the other critical settings that you would use for disulfide mapping? Yeah, for, for disulfide mapping, uh, there are two, uh, I would say, three critical uh, parameters. Uh, one of them is the maximum peptide size, so it should be a little bit increased because the peptides are bigger if they are, if they are combined with the disulfide bridge. The other one is the maximum number of disulfide bonds. So it should, for monoclonals, it should be three because in the hinge, in the hinge region, you have uh, three disulfide bridges and they are just separated with, with, one, uh, with one cleavage site. So with one missed cleavage site, you have three uh, disulfide bridges in, in one peptide. Um, and the last uh, parameter is the maximum number of chains, so this should be set to two, because uh, also in the hinge region uh, we have two uh, disulfide bridges, and there the, the two heavy chains are connected, and under non-reduced conditions these two heavy chains are, are together, so here a setting of two is the best choice. Excellent. So thank you for that comprehensive question, uh, comprehensive answer even. So with that, I would like to thank Shannon and Martin again, uh, and Jennifer for joining the Q&A panel as well. And I would like to thank you for your attendance today. And we hope that you have found this series of four webcasts based around peptide mapping useful and informative. Thank you very much.